you guys. Welcome to this episode here. We're going to be talking about the laver. Uh, as you can see, we are not in our studio. We're just here in our living room. Uh, this is more of a casual uh, conversation and meditation. But uh, yeah, our studio is completely set up for the documentary that we've been going through these what past two, two three months now. Yep. Yeah. So um, yeah, you guys, let's just get right into it. I don't want to bombard you guys with updates, but a lot has been going on. So we will put a update video out here shortly for the doc. Yeah. We, that's yeah. A good idea. Cool. So, but uh, yeah, without any further ado, let's get right into the laver meditation. Uh, we'll have a PowerPoint so you guys can follow along with us. I'll put that on the screen and Zach's going to go ahead and kick us off and we're just going to talk about it. podcast and when we see the laver show up it's in the sanctuary so Moses is given a blueprint from God and asked to build the sanctuary which typified Christ and so every detail was given put together by Belazalel and and it's important to study these details and signs but we're going to look at it in the context of Revelation, because Revelation is the sanctuary. When you go to Revelation, it's all about the sanctuary. So we go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. It says this. It says, Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. So what is this sea of glass that's before the throne? Well, let's uh, let's get some orientation under us. Some, uh, let's get uh, situated in the room here. We got chapters one through three in Revelation, and it's the seven churches. And we know symbolically they're represented by seven golden lampstands. So the seven golden lampstands, you know, it's you see that in the sanctuary. The sanctuary, the sanctuary has a golden lampstand, right? And Jesus being the high priest, he's he's got this priestly, you know, attire going on in chapter one, the golden band, and um, and he's the one who ministers to these seven churches. But then after chapter three, you get to the throne room picture, and you have a throne, and in, right in front of the throne, you have a sea of glass. It's like the courtyard picture. You have the altar, right, and yes, yeah, and the right. laver is immediately in front of the altar. And so what goes on the altar? A lamb slain. And this is in Revelation chapter 5. We see a lamb slain approaching this throne, mm -hmm. making him worthy. Him approaching the slaughtering place, the place where he became a sacrifice, you know, Calvary's cross. That's what qualifies him to enter into heaven and, and approach the heavenly throne where no created being mm -hmm. is allowed to approach outside of Christ. Okay, and so just to be clear, like, as we're going through this courtyard, you're saying that the bronze altar of burnt offering is more typical of Calvary's cross and how Christ was uh, consumed as sacrifice upon Calvary and then entering into the bronze laver is where we have this picture in Revelation and we see it in the sanctuary service and that represents Christ also, but how? Yeah, well, what I was getting at is like, uh, the whole altar picture is just helping us understand the sea of glass that's before the throne in Revelation. Uh, okay, so it's so like the it's bringing throne context. is in almost in the place of the altar. Like literally, where the altar is in the sanctuary, that's where the throne is. So ironically, there's oh, a parallel with the throne okay. yeah, yeah. and the place where he's slaughtered. You know, where or where the lamb would be slaughtered in the sanctuary. Interesting. Very interesting, right? Yeah. So they're, they're almost used interchangeably in a way. Yeah. Exactly. And so. It's the blueprints would reflect, or I should say this, I say the sanctuary is reflecting these heavenly blueprints, you know, the yeah. seven lamps and all this. And so the sea of glass is very interesting. This is the laver. Now, for those of you who have studied the laver, you'll know that the women of Israel brought a bunch of mirrors to place on the bottom. So mm -hmm. um, right here on the PowerPoint, Exodus 
38.8, it says he made the laver of bronze. So we're talking about the laver. Mm-hmm. And it's base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle meeting. Now, that's New King James Version. King James Version says they brought looking glasses. And ESV says mirrors. Mm-hmm. You know, it says it was a bronze stand, and they brought from the mirrors of the ministering women. So this laver has mirrors. Now we go back to Revelation. It's a sea of glass, right? Mm-hmm. There's this reflective quality that the laver brings. And a quick meditation on that. Let's go to our next. Uh, I kind of showed the orientation here. So a really quick orientation of the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. We see the laver, right, right above, right in front of the altar of sacrifice. And so there's our orientation in heaven. We see the lamb approaching the throne, but then the sea of glass before him. It's mirroring Mm -hmm. the the courtyard of the tabernacle. And, you know, Solomon's temple is similar. Now, it's interesting because his is called the sea of bronze or the, you know, the molten sea, which we'll get into that here in a second, you know, in our meditation. Right. Um, let's see, do I, okay, yeah, wait, wait, I'm going to go back here. Okay, so we're going to talk about what uh, this looking glass is. So, right, they bring all these mirrors, and we want to do a meditation on Mm -hmm. the significance of that word. In Hebrew, it's mar-ah. Okay, Okay. yeah, seems fair enough. And if you want the Strong's number, it's on the PowerPoint, H4759. Um, and it's mostly translated visions. So looking glass equals visions. Yeah, like, like let me give you some context here. So one verse, Genesis 46, 2 says, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Mm-hmm. Now, this is him telling him to go see Joseph in Egypt, you mm-hmm. know. And um, another example is Numbers 12, 6 says, he said, hear now my words. If a prophet is among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. And I shall speak to him in a dream. Mm-hmm. And then in 1 Samuel 3.15, says this. So Samuel laying down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Because remember, God, he spoke to God. And then God gave him a vision. Yeah, right. He, he, ga- he told him that Eli was going to die and all his sons. Yes. Okay, so it's this revelation of God. When a prophet is among you, because what's the role of a prophet? Well, the role of the prophet, what they usually do is they warn God's people. They warn God. Yeah, exactly. The war- they warn God's people, and um, they're bringing direct revelation from the throne room, right? Right. So it's it's this direct revelation, and... When you read the prophets and you understand how the prophets speak, it's always calling out sin and glorifying the atonement in Christ. Like, that's basically their stick. They always up, uplift the law, which mm-hmm. is, you know, the calling out of sin part, and they uplift the promises of God looking forward to the Messiah. And then in the New Testament, all the prophets are sharing the gospel and also saying that righteousness is was fulfilled in Christ, that you find in the law. So that's always the key things to a prophet. Mm -hmm. So this moray, right, it's this, if we could use, you know, a word that was derived from these, this very ancient word, it would be like a mirage. You start to see this image put together of what is, of what is so. So for us, like uh, devotionally, when we go to the laver, right, we're going to see those two things. We're going to see ourselves condemned in the law and the distinctness of Christ and his righteousness. Those are two things prophets always see, and, you know, and this is a direct revelation from God. This is a vision that he, using the the way the word is used in the Bible, this is a vision that he's giving to us. Hmm. And the vision is what? It's always a revelation of of those two things. Think about Samuel. Samuel brought a horrible story to Eli, you know? Yeah, ab- yeah, totally tragic. So, okay, so just to be clear, like what you're saying is that the prophets, they come and they call out sin, but they also magnify the justification by faith and atonement in Christ. But that symbolically represents, or not symbolically, but like metaphorically speaking, that could also 
be them bringing the laver to us in more of a devotional type way. Because even like us as Christians, we're going to have to go through that same experience. Although it's not, maybe it might not look like a prophet coming to you directly, but it could be more like the ministration of the Holy Spirit revealing sin to you through God's law, but also reminding you of the promises in God sort of thing. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And so you see why I'm connecting it to that, right? Should I, should I say it one yeah, more Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, yeah. No, that's good. Like, remind us how you're pulling from that picture in Revelation. Yeah, okay. Well, the first, remember, I'm going to Exodus looking at the laver and the word for mirrors there uh-huh. that the laver is built with okay. is the word mara. Mara, But okay. in other verses that we read, like in Numbers 12, 6, where he says, you know, I shall make myself known to him in a mara. So if there's a prophet among you, I'm going to give him knowledge in the form of a mara. And we can't translate it mirrors there. Mm -hmm. God's not giving him a revelation with mirrors. That wouldn't make really much sense in English. But the Hebrew is trying to identify this is a mirage. This is an image or a vision. Of, Of yourself. Of of in a, the, that's the I, the way the used you you find the word used since it's attached to the laver you realize prophets speak like lavers essentially interesting yeah and so for us for our lives when we read the prophets this is this should be a laver journey we should one come to ourselves realize our sin mm-hmm. take the rebuke upon ourselves you know not trying to read the rebukes for everyone else and think it applies to everyone else but think okay, these biblical rebukes apply to me. Like when I read the Canaan land and how they left a few you know, peoples there and then Joshua says, they're going to be a thorn in your side because you didn't deal with them. I apply that as like, whoa, if my body is the temple of God, you know, I, I'm, I better get, make sure to get rid of all the Canaanites because if I leave any, mm-hmm. I see it as sin and that sin is going to be a thorn in the thorn flesh. Thorn in the flesh. So, you know, and and start going through the scriptures, realizing like the scriptures are there to call out your life and to reform you so that you walk in God's righteous ways, but also there to show you the distinction of Christ and his righteousness and sacrifice. And knowing that they're the same, like when you come closest to Christ, Mm -hmm. those are the moments where you realize how sinful you are because you see the distinction between yourself and, and with him. But, but then at the same time, you're the closest to Christ. Yeah, ironically. And, and it's his covering and his justification that he gives you when you stand in that, in that position, you know? Yeah. When yeah, you're willing great... to go through the journey of that, you're being, you know that that is the evidence of your salvation because you're willing to go on that journey of truth, mm-hmm. true revelation. You're willing to look you know, at the Mara, and um, Jesus justifies that journey. His righteousness covers that journey. So, yeah. yeah. Amen. Okay, I want to, I wanna, now that we understand Mara and, you know, it has to do with mirrors. Okay, yeah, the Mara, the um, mirrors, or, or like the vision, right? Or like the vision, yeah. yeah. There's a couple times the word mirror is used in the New Testament. Okay. And I only, I only put one verse up here. So it's James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Mm-hmm. This is what it says. It says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and is not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. Mm. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So this is pretty significant, right? This illustration is saying that apparently a mirror is there to show you your reflection, obviously, but... Understanding that James and these New Testament authors truly do understand, you know, these sanctuary illustration and what they typify. Don't look into the moray or the mirror and then walk away and forget what you look like. It's, it's going to be a mirror held up to you. The perfect law of liberty 
That is what, well, you know what I mean? And you trying to live up to it, both of those things, looking at it, staying, keeping the standard of righteousness before you, and in trying to live up to it, where you'll see your shortcomings. Yes, you're, you'll see shortcomings, but that's okay because you're in the right direction. And what gives you the liberty to pursue a righteous life is Christ. He's given you grace. That's why Romans chapter 3 says, you know, speaking of the law of grace, he's like, because of the law of grace, we, we have established the law. It's the last verse in Romans chapter 3. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is you only have grace for things that you fail at, you know? Grace grace for things that you fail at? Like, like you, the only reason you'd be given grace is if you needed grace for oh, something. Right. If there was no law or no point, you wouldn't, need, you wouldn't need grace. You need grace, the resources of heaven. You need help from on high. You need forgiveness of sins. You need all those things to stay on track. And without that, mm-hmm. you, you can't do that. So without looking to Christ and, and him justifying your life, Mm-hmm. You know, there would be no point in following the law because one failure would just equate to you giving up and quitting. Right. There would be no point in continuation. Okay. 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 I think I'm getting it. So, but because you're continuing and pursuing a standard, a righteous standard, the law of liberty, and you're not forgetting it, you're not walking away as to what that righteousness yeah. is. You're acknowledging that that is the standard what you're trying to achieve. Thus, you know, you are establishing the law. So, I guess the opposite of that would be if you if you didn't establish the standard of righteousness, if you didn't establish the law, would that be the equivalent to looking into the mirror and then forgetting what you look like? If you didn't establish the law, yeah, because because the law I'm seeing it mm-hmm. as we're going through this is acting or representing the moray. The law is supposed to be a mirror so that you can constantly look into it see your shortcomings so that you can come to Christ for grace. That, that's how I'm kind of seeing that. Am I, am I wrong there? No, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think you're picking up on something really good here. So, yeah, you're looking at the law, right? And like you said, it's a, it, it's a constant mirror of, of what righteousness is. So, again, seeing Christ is watching someone who's lived that out perfectly. And the closer you get to Christ, you're going to realize how short you fall, Mm -hmm. but how much more you can appreciate at that point the righteousness required to save you and the love of Christ thus matches that revelation. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. The more, right, what does he say? The more what? What does, remember, Jesus says... uh, at the at his foot washing, when that when the woman comes and washes his feet, he says, "The more oh, like the the when Mary's washing his feet, the like if you've been forgiven much, you love much." Yeah, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I used the word more. I don't think that was there, but yeah, 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 yeah. Right, forgiven much, you will love much, and that's the whole point of the more is like you realize the magnitude, the perpetuity. And the infinite quality that righteousness is, mm-hmm. that God demands, mm-hmm. how far you far sh- fall short. Yeah. The more you know you fall short, doesn't mean you're like going into sin. Right. It just means your revelation of what God requires is so much higher than you originally had any concept of. Yeah. And the more you know you're forgiven, the more you know you need grace. The more you establish the law, yeah. and the more you love Christ, and the more you can cling on His promises and not be wavering, tossed to and fro. I guess like how James. Well, would it also. becomes a it becomes a lifeboat as opposed, you know, to just a a floaty noodle. Like you're not you're not treating it as a pool party. You're treating it as a search and rescue. Yeah, mission. I like that. That's a, no, that's a good variable. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like it changes. Like you thought it was a pool party. Until sharks started swimming around you, you realize, wait a second, yeah. this is not a pool party. Right, the floaties aren't going to be much The Titanic help. <laughs> is sinking. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, okay, I think practically also how I'm thinking about it is, and it's also helping me to understand the sanctuary service a little more, because you can't just go through the bronze altar of burnt offering and then pass the laver. The laver has to be a necessary 
uh, stop and requirement before you can enter into the holy the holy place, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah, right. It's part of that courtroom, and everything in um, the outside courtyard mm-hmm. is bronze, mm-hmm. and bronze is associated with judgment, which we're gonna get here in a little bit. But before we get there, mm-hmm. I want to look at the word laver. Or, um, yeah, laver. And the unique translations that we find with this. So the word laver is uh, kior in Hebrew, and that is Strong's H3595. But it's not always translated laver. In First Samuel 2.14, mm-hmm. it's translated pan for cooking. And that's what the laver does. It cooks us. Cooks us. Yeah. Solomon's temple, it wasn't called the lava. It was called the molten sea. Sea of lava. Kind of like the lake of fire at the end of oh, yeah, that's Revelation. A, right, good connection. Where the whole world becomes a molten sea. The whole world becomes a lava. A looking glass. A looking glass. It's not just lava that's burning and causing suffering for the wicked. It's the revelation of their sin and the rejection of atonement that brings terror to their soul Hmm. this is true in you know the microcosm of a narcissistic codependent relationship if the codependent builds up the courage to set boundaries and to call out and distinguish himself from the narcissist then what does the narcissist do the narcissist in self you know being being a mirror being held up to the narcissist and receiving some self uh, revelation rages at the fact that anyone would point out their faults, that anyone would distinguish themselves from the narcissist, mm. and and th- this is what throws the narcissist into rage. So at the end times, you see people gnashing teeth, right? And you weeping, look, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. You go to Acts, you go to the stoning of Stephen, yeah. you realize gnashing of teeth is rage. Anger. They, it says it, they gnashed their teeth at him. And shut up their ears. And shut up their ears and stoned him and killed him. And so even at end times, they're in this laver experience. They rage against Christ and ultimately it becomes a laver of molten lava, a fiery fiery hmm. issuance from the throne that de- destroys you know all the wicked. Mm-hmm. But we, we go through that now so that we have eternal life then. Hmm. Let God point out our sin now so that during this time it might be forgiven. Mm-hmm. Right? Why avoid it now? Don't, let's, let us not be the narcissist that is avoiding the conflict of sin in the soul. But let's face the sin in our soul, acknowledge that it's there, and confess it. And come under... You know, humiliation. How much time we got? Uh, we got about a minute, and then we can start wrapping it up. So do a part two. Yeah, we're going to have to do part two, guys. Yeah, Th- This is just a short meditation, you guys. Um, yeah, we'll do part two, maybe even a part three. And, uh, yeah, this has been edifying for me. and, and oh, even That's because yeah. it gets really good. It gets good. Here, so why don't we go ahead and finish? Um, why don't we wrap up this? No, because then we're going to get no, into Solomon's prayer. I'm going to get into sneak peek. This is sneak peek, guys. Okay. So if you watch this, this is just the intro. Yeah. All four viewers of, you know. <laughs> no. You know, whoever watches this, know this that the laver, the word kior, look this up. Mm-hmm. I you know, I hope Isaiah puts this, you know, on the video. The word kior mm-hmm. can be translated scaffold. It's translated scaffold or platform. Second uh, Chronicles 6:13. And this is a picture of Solomon praying, hands up, dedicating the temple, and he's kneeling on a laver, the yeah. same word that's used in the sanctuary. And when we read his prayer, we're going to realize some great things. This is the practical application of the laver. Mm-hmm. This is the soul cry of the laver. This is a prophetic foresight of Christ as the laver. Right. And we're going to see sort of this epicness of mm-hmm. what the laver can teach and what we behold in 
the man named Peace mm -hmm. praying from the laver. Yeah. All right. Hey, okay, That's you guys. It. That's it. Yeah. Thank you for watching this part, Wood. See you guys in a second.